Hello and welcome to the Pari Center and this exploration of Galileo at 400, looking through 21st century telescopes. Today we will be holding part two of this series, exploring outer and inner spaces with Avi Loeb and Dean Radin. Avi Loeb is a professor of science at Harvard University and a best-selling author. He has written eight books, including most recently Extra Extraterrestrial and nearly a thousand papers. He is director of the Institute for, the, uh, for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and he also serves as head of the Galileo Project. Dean Radin is also here with us today and is chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Associate, Associate Distinguished Professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is the author of over 300 scientific and popular articles, four dozen book chapters, and nine books, including The Conscious Universe, Entangled Minds, Supernormal, and Real Magic. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Alex. Welcome. Thank you, Eleanor. Well, it's a great, great honor to host you both. I admire you both tremendously, and this really feels like a celebration of Galileo at 400. Thank you very much for agreeing to, to be here. So we have this lovely challenge today, which is that, that both together can perform as greater than the sum of the parts, and the parts are pretty, are pretty big already, and, and it's pretty spectacular what you both do in your own realm. So I'll try to be as much out of the way as possible, and just hope that by a few questions I've prepared, I can give some structure for a conversation to take place where, where there's truly an exchange. So I'll, I'll shoot straight in because there's, there's so much to cover. And so you both are pioneers exploring inner and outer spaces. And so in a way, Dean points the telescope inwards, metaphorically, and Avi points it to outer space. The question there is where's the connection or, or where can we find an overlap to start this exchange? And I thought that an obvious overlap is the question of anomalies and anomalies that are not just interesting. I think they're really, really important. So my first question, but feel free to take it and go wherever you want in your own conversation, is what can UAPs, you identified anomalous phenomena do for psi, psychical phenomena, and respectively, uh, the converse, what can psi phenomena do for UAP research? And with that, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, maybe I will start uh, by saying thank you first for inviting us. Um, um, you know, humans existed only for the past uh, few million years on Earth. We are relatively recent. And so when you talk about the human experience, uh, that is not part, that was not part of uh, the universe until the last uh, one part in, in 10,000 of the age of the universe. So don't think of it as an essential and important component as something that the universe could not exist without. Okay. And you can call it an emergent phenomena, something that happened by chance because there was a soup of chemicals that resulted in uh, microbial life that eventually became complex enough. Uh, to make uh, humans like us. And of course, it's not the end of history because we are now creating artificial intelligence. Okay, so we left, uh, we started from uh, the chimpanzees and we developed language and started working together. And now we think that we are at the pinnacle of creation. And by uh, uh, creating our own technologies, we demonstrate exactly the opposite, that you can make out of uh, silicon chips something that is more capable than our own intelligence. So I wouldn't really ascribe a very significant uh, role to human uh, ex the human experience because it was a byproduct. We came to the cosmic play late. We are not at the center of stage. We tended to think that, but we are not. And that started with Galileo uh, asking people to look through the telescope. We are not at the center. I mean, there are moons moving around Jupiter, he argued. And moreover, you know, we uh, we we just came at the end. So so if you arrive to a play at the end of the play, you are not at the center of stage. The play is not about you. But we have this tendency of thinking that we are really important in that play. I say no. That in fact there might be other players out there, and we that that may have been around longer, and we better look for them because they may have a better perspective. 
Now, when you say look in and look out and how anomalies show up, you know, we, you know, we, each of us got our body uh, from our parents. You know, we didn't really design it. We shouldn't take credit for it. It's not as if when you tell me what I am, I cannot take credit for that. It's not something that I designed. It's not something that I created. It's something that I was born into and ha is happening around me. And I'm not closer to myself than I am to understanding the universe at large. Uh, I don't understand either. And so part of that uh, uh, ignorance is finding anomalies, things that we can't really explain. And we can't explain things about ourselves. We can't explain things about the universe. But it's not as if one gives validation for the other. We are ignorant on both fronts. That's my perspective. Well, I would have a, a similar response, uh, except that uh, I, for years I've been going to a conference uh, from the Society for Scientific Exploration, which is basically all about conventional scientists' interest in anomalies of all type. And for many years, there were two topics that were, were always would show up. There was always something about UFOs. There was always something about psychic phenomena, because they're both observations that are unexpected anomalies, and it attracts interest from a lot of scientists and a lot of lay people as well, of course. So the, I, I watched uh, the, the interview that Alex had with you, Avi, in August of last year, and I just remarked to him beforehand that if you had said exactly the same thing over the course of that entire interview about the constraints of academia, about how difficult it is for people for young people who want to pursue these kinds of topics, uh, how government funding is is all is all screwy because these actually are things that the taxpayers would want to pay. All of those kinds of comments. If you had just taken every place where you said UFO and put in something about psychic experience, I would have said exactly the same thing. So that one of the things that, that scientists discover who who start deviating from the status quo is you're attacked and you're, you, you find that suddenly editors that you've worked with forever are, have prejudices. And it's, it's the same story over and over again. You also said something which is very, which I understand as well, which is you can't really worry too much about what all these other people are saying or doing. Otherwise, science would never advance. So it's simply par for the course for what happens. So the, the telescopes, it's true. One, the telescopes have deviated away from where people are generally looking. So you're looking, looking for UFOs. We turn it inwards and we look at human experience. And they're both considered anomalous, mainly because it doesn't fit current theories, just as you were saying. So what do we have to offer to each other? I would say at this point, we offer emotional support. And maybe also like, like the notion of a number of years ago, there was a proposal that all federal funding for research dollars have 1% set aside for what the the population wants to, to learn about. And so there could be a long list of such things. It could be UFOs. It could be survival of bodily death. It could be a whole bunch of things. 1% set aside for that kind of research, which is a huge amount of money, of course, and it is regularly turned down. So maybe... This is a, a, you can raise the proposal again among people who you talk to in Congress saying, actually, a lot of people would like to know about all kinds of things that the NIH and the NSF are not studying. Well, let's raise it with Congress once it gets its act back together again, and maybe they'll fund it this time. Yeah, I, I should also mention that uh, this morning I uh, just posted in medium.com a new essay. And uh, the title of that essay was Facts are irrelevant to pro-truth pretenders. And what do I mean by that? I mean, people who have a narrative, but say, don't confuse me with the facts. And when you show them the facts, they deny the facts, but they are pretending at the same time that they are representing integrity, scientific truth, and protecting the progress of science. Yeah. And I have several such examples that I mentioned in this essay. But my personal example is a meteor that was identified by U.S. government satellites and was 
analyze the data from it was analyzed by you the u.s space command uh, again and again and the, then they reported back to nasa that they stand by the high speed that this meteor had and i went to retrieve materials from this object brought them back and analyzed them at harvard university and at the same time there were scientists who only studied objects from the solar system in their career and they argued that the U.S. government data must be wrong because it doesn't fit their narrative. And you ask yourself, how arrogant can a scientist be to dismiss data that doesn't quite fit the model? I mean, we know that most of the matter in the universe, 83% of it, is a substance that was never witnessed in the solar system. And by now, it's mainstream. So... How can we be arrogant enough to say that if something doesn't quite fit a model based on what we already saw in the solar system, that the data must be wrong? And that is the reality as of the past few months in the subject that I studied and dedicated months to explore. You know, it took a lot of effort to seek the evidence, to go after that meteor, to collect the materials, to analyze months and months. And these people, just based on their opinion, published in the Astrophysical Journal claiming that. And of course, there are political examples. Uh, most recently, you know, there was the uh, massacre of uh, Israeli citizens, 1,400 of them, very brutal, women, infants, elderly. And on the same day, just hours after this massacre took place, there were... 34 student groups at Harvard University who wrote, who wrote a letter stating that the victims are to be blamed for what happened to them. And this is in an academic institution. And you might expect, of course, the leadership to say something to those students because it's an education, uh, educational institution, but it never happened. And then a week later, the New York Times published a headline that was on the front website um, saying that uh, a hospital was bombed by Israel and uh, they didn't check the facts. And when the U.S. government looked into the facts, international organizations looked into it, it looked like uh, a, a faulty rocket that was launched from within Gaza that did the damage. So all I'm saying is, you know, before you make statements that conform to your cherished beliefs, you should check the data. And here we are talking about a premier university, perhaps arguably one of the best in the world, a premier news organization, arguably one of the best in the world, do, making this mistake over the past month. And this is just an example that came to light as a result of recent political events, a wartime event. But if it happens in this context, it happens all the time. And uh, you and I know about more examples. Yeah, yeah. Don't confuse me with the facts. Happens right. Everywhere. And by, by, by the way, George Orwell uh, obviously forecasted that when in his novel, uh, 1984, yeah. he uh, mentioned the slogan, uh, war is peace, and the ignorance is uh, strength, you know, and the, obviously that is exactly the kind of slogan you would bring up in the context of the examples I just mentioned. Yeah. So how does one maintain the epistemic humility that we read in Galileo in the essay, uh, at least with respect to the comments he makes of those who he's trying to rebut and, and those who are attempting to rebut him, how does one maintain that epistemic humility in, in, in nowadays post-truth climate? And maybe a related reflection or question about that is you can play the eccentric for so long, but quite easily you can be shifted into a heretic. And I think you're both examples of really solid researchers who've navigated those waters with grace but that's not that easy for everyone. So, so how do you how do you do it so that you're not killed in the process? Well, it's it's not about us personally. It's about the scientific method which Galileo pioneered, and that is being sufficiently humble to surrender to whatever the facts 
show you. Okay, so that it's not about us, it's about reality. Okay, so you know, it's not about how many likes you get on Twitter or what is how popular your ideas are, are but whether the evidence supports them. And of course, if you are not certain, uh, it's worth collecting more evidence. So when people say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, the, the important thing to say is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding, extraordinary effort. You really need to engage in seeking the evidence. You can't just make this statement and rely on your opinions, which most people just do, because that's the lazy path. The lazy path is to have an opinion and not, and in fact, even when the evidence comes along, you dismiss the evidence because of your opinions. That is what the clergy did during the days of Galileo. And of course, it's easy to subscribe to a club that says to everyone, we are important. We are at the center of the world. That's what was said at the time of Galileo. He was going against that. So all these false narratives that humans tend to believe in, they serve an important psychological purpose. In the context of having a partner out there in outer space or having another a smarter kid on the block, obviously the psychological barrier is that we will have to admit that maybe we are not the pinnacle of creation. Maybe we are not the smartest. Uh, so far on earth, we have um, the sense of superiority. And now perhaps AI systems will shake it a little bit. Uh, that's a kind of alien intelligence that is made of something else, not the, the human brain. But um, eventually, you know, people just don't want to hear any news or any possible evidence that may indicate. Uh, and I see that as a sign of arrogance. Uh, now, how do you maintain humility? Well, you just surrender to whatever the data tells you. And moreover, you're seeking the data irrespective of the consequences. And I think that is the most difficult part, that most people are not brave enough to uh, chase anomalies, to chase um, things that are not fully understood because they enjoy the comfort of having a tribe that supports a particular opinion, and, and then they get support. It's a support group. But if you are exploring the unknown, you're on your own in some way. You, you have to collect the data. It's a lot of work. And then you have to subscribe to a, a, a view that is not necessarily popular. And of course, if you discover gravitational waves that everyone believed in for a century, then uh, you are not risking too much. And, and that's what LIGO did. But that also cost more than a billion dollars and decades of effort. It didn't fall into our lap the way that people, and nobody said extraordinary claims require, we shouldn't fund the search for gravitational waves because everyone believed it exists. The same was true about the Higgs. But when people tried to go and find something new with the Large Hadron Collider for $10 billion, and that is called supersymmetry that everyone believed in, they didn't find it. But that was no tragedy. Nobody said, oh, it was too speculative to start with and invest 10 billion. So that is the way science is done. You explore the unknown. Sometimes you are wrong. Sometimes you are right. But it's it should be encouraged. Curiosity should be the foundation. And my fundamental uh, frustration is, why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity? Mm. So how do I maintain uh, humility? I think that's simply a, a psychological trait that I have. I've always had that. But when I'm asked by students, uh, what do I need to do in order to go into a field that you're doing? Like I'm exploring mystical and psychic states. What do I do? And they come from lots of different fields, physics and psychology and neuroscience. And I usually discourage them. I wish I did not have to because I say, well, it's going to entail a lot of risk. You will, you will find it difficult to have a career in a discipline which is too far off the beam. That will change eventually. And so I, I personally then take comfort in the history of science. The history of science, you see this the same kind of sequence happen again and again and again. And even reading the, the biographies of Nobel laureates, you see that they, they were ignored for decades. And then finally, the rest of science caught up to them. And then it said, oh, okay, you were right all along. And if you're lucky enough, you you live long enough to get a prize. But of course, that's not why they were doing it in the first place. They were doing it because of curiosity. So the humility comes back, uh, comes to me from the idea that any explorer is going gonna, is gonna to have arrows shot at them. And that's that's just the name of the game. If you can take the risk, great. If not, do something more conventional. 
Mm. I see. I want to bring it back to the point of contact. That really interests me. Of course, the sociological issues and the political issues you, you're discussing are so important, but bringing it back to consciousness and Galileo's programmatic separation and prioritization of the objective world, in, in a way, one can see science as a 400 year experiment where consciousness was placed to the side and was say well we'll come to you later now you mentioned extraordinary claims and i pay attention to the prefixes of the world is a fixation of mine and you study extra or you're in search of extraterrestrial minds what could say um avi and you dean are in search of extrasensory capacities so in both cases i see another point of contact um, that it's these higher minds or consciousnesses in a state that we are not so used to experiencing it. So I would invite you to, to discuss, again, these possible points of context as to the object of study which you're pursuing, which is, I mean, I wonder where this consciousness, I mean, in the case of Dean, it's, it's more obvious that this is mostly about consciousness. In the case of Avi, you're looking for the artifacts of other consciousness in the universe. So I, I see an obvious point there, and it has a lot to do with Galileo 400 years later. Yeah, but uh, one thing to uh, clarify in the context of science, you know, I represent the physical sciences, that's what I've been doing for 40 years, um, is that humans cannot be used as detectors. That's a point that is often confused, because in the legal system, you put, uh, you know, people in jail based on what other people said. But in science, you cannot write a scientific paper saying this person told me that. That doesn't hold water. You can't substantiate claims. And the reason is simple, because uh, when you look at a car accident, different people report different things while witnessing the same facts. And the uh, FIFA in the Women's World Cup this summer recognized that. They base rulings about goals based on video cameras. Not They didn't go around and ask the players, do you think the ball crossed the you know, enter the goal, or they didn't ask the audience, the spectators, they just based it on data collected by instruments. And that's what a lot of people uh, fail to recognize, that um, in learning about the reality that we all share, we best use instruments that are fully under control and are well calibrated. That's the method of science. And that is the method that Galileo pioneered. But of course, in the humanities, we are dealing with people, uh, you know, like um, psychologists have to understand how people behave. And obviously that, uh, you know, you cannot really uh, use instruments to measure people, uh, people's mind in the way that you do for physical objects. So it's a much more challenging task. But I just wanted to clarify that in physical sciences, it's all about instruments. And, you know, that... Uh, after practicing this for four decades or so, I can say that um, you know when when you deal just with physical objects, it feels lonely, um, in a sense that um, the Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg uh, wrote um, in his book the first three minutes. At the end of it, he said, "The more we comprehend the universe, uh, the more pointless it looks." And um, uh, my understanding of that is that the universe appears uh, pointless to those who study just lifeless objects like elementary particles, radiation, stars, and so forth. Once we find a partner out there, once we find another intelligent species, uh, you know, it will give a meaning to our existence in the same way that uh, doing it in our private lives, you know, finding a partner. Uh, provides us with a meaning to our existence. So, so you know, I do believe that uh, having uh, partners is really important. But uh, when you're trying to learn about the physical reality, you can't rely on what people tell you. Yeah, and I would agree, actually. So I, I study uh, psychic experience, and we don't simply ask people what their experience is, although that does become a data point in the sense of it is an observation. The question is, can we confirm that observation under controlled conditions so that we can exclude coincidence and confabulation and all of the usual psychological reasons? And the answer is, sure, we can do that. We, we use the same instruments that you would in psychophysiology. We use physical instruments. We, all of our measures are ultimately objective. 
And we use the same methods of st statistics and so on for experimental designs. So there, I, I detect a, a small uh, prejudice that uh, only purely physical measurements are those worth paying attention to. And I can tell you then as a psychologist, that is not true. There, of course, you don't you don't just rely on what people say uh, from an anecdotal perspective, but you can use rigorous methods in the laboratory to figure out what's going on. The, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that in terms of the uh, SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has for many years been using essentially electromagnetics to, to try to find signals from other places. My guess is that that is not going to work very well because even if there are other civilizations out there that have radio and are somehow wafting towards us, uh, we may not be able to recognize the signal out of the noise. And even if we did recognize the signal, it wouldn't make any sense to us. So I would say instead, given that I think the evidence for uh, what we can call non-local consciousness phenomena, there's pretty good evidence for that, uh, that we should be doing SETI based on people who have these abilities. So uh, just recently, there was a meta-analysis on remote viewing, so the, another modern term for clairvoyance, and a Bayesian analysis was done. It was a Bayesian meta-analysis, and so the Bayes factor was 300,000 to 1. So in the Bayes world, a Bayes factor of 100 to 1 is considered decisive evidence. This is 300,000 to 1. So this is based on uh, roughly 40 years' worth of experiments, some at Princeton, some by the US government and elsewhere. Uh, and of course, as in any modern meta-analysis, you look at selective reporting and other kinds of questionable research practices, and they don't account for this overall effect. So I would say then that the uh, probably more effective or efficient version of SETI would find uh, that there are strange forms of consciousness out there that we may be able to detect, which we're not gonna pick up as radio waves. Well, I, I, I would add to that that um, waiting for a radio signal is just like uh, waiting for a phone call at home. You need the counterpart to be active at the time that you're listening because these signals move at the speed of light. And if they were sent a billion years ago, they are very far away by now. However, yeah. physical objects, you know, they are just like a package that arrived to our mailbox. They stay around and then... Um, especially if they move at the speed of our spacecraft, uh, they would uh, stay bound to the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, we would find them just like plastics in the ocean. They will keep accumulating over time. And that that approach was not practiced until the last decade. And that's, that's what the Galileo project that I'm leading at Harvard University is all about. Talking right. about instruments, I'd like to ask you about theory, because to me, and I'm a theoretician by training, theories are some sort of mental instrumentation we have. And back to Galileo and his remarks about how the book of nature is written. Of course, he emphasized mathematics. And, and so what do you think is the role of theory and mathematics? And also this idea that there's some secrets in nature and somehow we can, with a lot of effort and good luck, extract some of them. In what language are there and how useful are theories? And a follow-up question to that, because they're related, will be, well, we can go further than theory and we can talk about metaphysics and philosophy, because we, we, we've, we've said something about epistemic humility, but I wonder about metaphysical or ontological humility. And here, the elephant in the room, at least for me, it's materialism. So we go from pure measurement to the need of th for theories to what's the philosophical system that's sustaining these, these layers. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, first of all, I should uh, emphasize the fact that communication is the biggest challenge um, with uh, sentient beings. And uh, of course, uh, it's easier for us uh, because we share, uh, as humans, we share the same uh, physiological uh, buildup. Uh, and that allowed, for example, Alan Turing to decode the enigma uh, during World War II because the Germans had the, the human brain as much as the British had, and he could have figured out what they might mean more easily. But if we receive a signal from uh, beings that were subjected to a different set of uh, Darwinian selection than we find here on Earth, if they evolved in environments that are very different than the ones that we witness here on, on Earth, 
they might have different uh, cognition than we have. Um, so there are two fundamental questions. How is cognition shaped by the environment, which we don't fully understand? I mean, uh, obviously there is this uh, mantis uh, shrimp that has eyes uh, sensitive to ultraviolet, to infrared light, uh, far more capable than the human eye. At the same time, you have the blind shrimp that doesn't see anything. And it would be really interesting to examine the brain patterns of the two and figure out how the environment or the sensor, the sensory information that the, the brain receives uh, shapes cognition. And then the second is how uh, language is being is reflect reflecting uh, cognition, and that again is not uh, fully understood and. Uh, would be a, a very interesting subject to explore also with artificial intelligence in the future. Um, and so um, there is this big challenge of us understanding signals coming from far away. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps we'll use our own AI systems to figure out extraterrestrial AI systems, you know, because they would feel kinship to those more than to us. So I have uh, great hopes for our technological kids. Uh, just like my daughters, I don't fully understand them, but uh, I hope that uh, they would uh, tell me when they see something that I cannot understand. And so um, uh, my hope is that uh, science in the future will be uh, helped by AI systems. And that includes decoding signals that may be artificial in origin and telling us that they are not natural and that they look very different than what you might expect from a natural source. And, and perhaps the AI can also help you communicate with your daughters. <laughs> By the way, I wrote about all of this in a, in last week on medium.com. So anyone interested, then there is an article about that. I would say uh, uh, theory for non-local consciousness is lagging behind the empirical data. It, it has always done that. One of the reasons for that probably is that science is based on materialism and because of, uh, after David Chalmers' idea of uh, the hard problem of consciousness, namely first person subjective awareness, there's renewed interest in other philosophies, that, uh, including things like panpsychism and idealism and so on. From the point of view of anything other than materialism, other post-materialist concepts, Suddenly, the the notion that um, the the mind brain system is actually extended through space and time uh, is no longer quite as strange as it is under a purely materialistic perspective. But I need to add immediately that our idea about what material means has very significantly changed as a result of quantum mechanics. And I think in quantum mechanics today is not the end of quantum mechanics; it's the beginning of something that will even be stranger, probably. Uh, so. Materialism, the notion of what we mean by that will probably change and the philosophical constraints provided by what we can think of as a classical form of material, that's going to change as well. So eventually there may be a material explanation for, for psychic events. Maybe it's it has to do with quantum brain or quantum biology or something of that sort. And there are people pursuing that direction. And other theories, uh, physical theories that may account for these kinds of phenomena include things like retrocausation, which used to be pretty much dismissed in physics and now is, is being reconsidered. It is one of the viable ways of thinking about quantum mechanics. Uh, there are multidimensional theories, there's morphogenetic field theories, there's a number of different theories. The challenge in all cases is, as Avi was saying about things like string theory, how can you test it and find out if it's actually true? Well, sometimes the theories tend to encompass the entire universe, and it's not so easy to figure out how would I know if this theory versus that theory was actually true. Yeah, I should say that uh, we live for a short time, okay, at least, you know, until uh, we figure out a way to extend human lifespan beyond the century or so. Um, and uh, that has implications. It means that you shouldn't spend your life chasing ghosts. You should spend your life on attempts to understand things uh, based on evidence that will uh, bring us new knowledge. And that's what I say to my friends who work on string theory. You know, they've been doing that for most of their life. And 
we can't see even in the foreseeable future a way of testing these ideas. And, you know, I had the breakfast with one of them uh, half a year ago, and I said, what is your most important scientific paper? And he said, it's a paper about supersymmetry. And I said, well, uh, you know that the, the Large Hadron Collider didn't find it. So why would you consider that as your most important paper? That doesn't register in his mind as a failure. Even if reality is not described as supersymmetry, he will still think that it was an accomplishment to write this paper. Now, uh, that reminded me of uh, the ultra-Orthodox community in Brooklyn, the Lubavitchers, who believe that the rabbi is the Messiah. And when there was, uh, and so they believed it so much that they said that when he will die, uh, he will come back shortly afterwards as the Messiah to the land of Israel. So they built an apartment for him there that uh, is a replica of his apartment in Brooklyn so that he will find the toilets easily. And then he died. That was a data point, just like supersymmetry was not found by the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, he didn't come back. So what was their response? It was still their most important idea. They said, let's just wait more. And I say many of the people who are engaged in string theory or believe in supersymmetry are no different. So when people say science is supposed to be superior to belief systems, I say, go around and ask those people, the practitioners, and some of them you will find are no different. Yeah, so some of the, one of the reasons why string theory or supersymmetry persists, I think, is because from the mathematical point of view, it is beautiful, right? It, it has an aesthetic wow. appeal to the people who are producing it. And then just like an artist will create something which nobody else likes, but they will love it because- Well, it, there, there is a difference between uh, uh, drawing something beautiful and claiming that it exists. Yes. Okay. And uh, of course, in art, you have a lot of beautiful things or in mathematics. Take mathematics as an example. Uh, so, of course, you can have beautiful things, but they have they may, beauty and truth are not the same thing. In the sense that, by truth, I mean that it's represented in reality. I mean, yeah. the way to figure it out is to put the goggles of Mark Zuckerberg on your head, and you live in the metaverse. And there, you may live next to celebrities in a house that is worth a hundred million dollars, but it's not the reality. So, it's a beautiful idea. And you can pay uh, the hundreds of dollars that it costs to get these goggles just for the sake of it. You can also take some recreational drugs and believe in things that are beautiful. And it would not change the reality that we live in. So that's the distinction I make. Uh, my objective is to learn about the reality that we live in. If your objective is to be happy, go ahead, enjoy the beautiful things in your mind. But don't call yourself a physicist. Yeah. But humans are very adept at uh, falling in love with things that are true for them, but maybe not for everyone else. It's just, it's, it, it's something to be expected from a, some well, percentage of the population. So, so that's, the, that's the whole point that uh, Galileo spent, uh, you know, his life on. People have truths that are different from reality. How do we find out what is real? By attending to data. Okay, right. so of course that was true all along that people used to have ideas about what is beautiful and wanted them to be the truth. But if you do an experiment and you find something different, you should use the guillotine of the experiment to chop the head of ideas that are not real. Why? Because we need to adapt to the reality that we all share. Okay, we might want to believe that uh, nothing can kill us. Because that's a, a very good, but then you uh, confront COVID-19 and you realize, oh, that's a real risk. Now, the fact that you believe in a beautiful idea that you will live forever doesn't make you live forever. You better adapt to the possibility that COVID-19 can kill you because then you might take a vaccine. And uh, the same is true about, suppose you want to reach Mars. You can believe in the idea that everything moves around the earth. But you will never reach Mars if you were to believe in that because you, your rocket will go in the wrong direction. So reality exists. And if we want to adapt to it, we better follow data about it and not beautiful ideas. I agree. Now, in the face of the unknown, at least in my case, I, I oscillate often between doubt and belief. I think belief is 
not just necessary, perhaps it's unavoidable, like a creature that just goes forward and then at some point needs to check and then that could be doubt and then choose another direction. I think that's how we navigate or I like to think in these terms. So I wonder, and this is kind of, it's not a personal question, but it's a question about your own work for each of you. Where do you think you could be most significantly significantly wrong in what you're doing? Like what would be the, the, the highest vulnerability like in 10 years, in 20 years, realize, oh no, this thing, I really believed in it because the data was pointing me there. Maybe I'm like, I'm asking you in a way to show your scientific vulnerability. Yeah, so I, I do think that um, in life, it's important to be an optimist because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you're always a pessimist, you're doomed and not to succeed in finding anything really important. So while it's good to be attracted to uh, what is possible that might be exciting, it's also important to admit when something doesn't go your way. Okay, uh, now what would I regard as, um, frankly, um, just um, if I were to surrender to the public opinion when it turns, turns out that my original opinion was the correct one, that would be the most devastating to me. Um, so I would rather err on the side of being wrong so that maybe people will hold it against me, but at least I was checking a possibility that ended up being wrong. At least I was doing the work. And, uh, and you know, it could well be that we are alone. It could well be that there is no one out there, that there is nothing beyond the physical reality that we already know about, and that's it. Uh, it will disappoint me, of course, but uh, so be it. At least I know that I dedicated my life to something that inspired me but ended up being wrong. However, if uh, I were to surrender be, uh, prematurely, just in order to get honors and awards, to get likes on social media, that would be the worst, in my opinion. Yeah. So I think if any scientist, especially empiricists, are, are always, uh, people will ask me, well, do I believe in psychic phenomena after having studied these things for 40 years? And my answer is I have pretty high confidence based on the data of experiments, but there's always some doubt. And, and as everyone knows that there is no such thing as a perfect experiment. That's why we, we're always improving methods. And so if we're unlucky, one of, the, one of the things that we overlooked in an experimental design turns out to be an artifact. Well, so if somebody then brings it to our attention, we're thinking, ooh, that's, that's not very good, but I'll fix it next time and I won't make that mistake again. So when you look at the, the history of how experimental methods uh, devise over time and how protocols are de designed, they do tend to get better and better, in which case our confidence gets higher and higher. Uh, many years ago, I started doing meta-analyses of, of the data within parapsychology, and the results look really, really good. And then meta-analysis begins to advance, and people say, well, did you take into account selective reporting, and did you take into account all of these other factors? So over the 20 or 30 years since I started to do this, meta-analysis itself has become much more comprehensive, but also more believable. The results are a lot better. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's still going in the same direction as I originally had found. If it didn't, I would be disappointed and would simply have to accept it. But so far, my guesses have been in the, in the correct direction, or at least in the preferred direction. But there's always some room for doubt. There has to be. There's no perfect experiment. Um, I guess we should uh, clarify what evidence is, because uh, at least in the chat, some people were confused about that. And uh, just to explain, evidence is data collected by instruments that are recording the data. And the data is about, at least in the context of the physical sciences, the data is about events that take place uh, uh, or objects that we study. So it's yeah. data collected by instruments. Think about a thermometer measuring the temperature on the day that you're looking at it. Think about um, a video camera recording the image that uh, you see. Uh, this is data because you can go back to the electronic version of that data and analyze it. And you can use the laws of physics as we know them to interpret what the data means. And if the data doesn't look 
as if it can be explained by what we already know, it's called an anomaly. And that is the most interesting thing you can get because then you ask yourself, okay, well, is it new physics? Is it something that we haven't thought about using old physics, but we haven't thought about phenomena like that? And that's interesting because it can bring you uh, to realms of new knowledge. And however, most practitioners tend to brush uh, anomalies under the carpet. Why? Because they establish their reputation and stature on past knowledge. So when you feel important based on what you already know, you don't want anything new to come along. So you basically dismiss the existence of anomalies. I mean, I felt that uh, as a kid, when I would ask a difficult question at the dinner table and the adults in the room would pretend that uh, there is no basis to the question, even though they didn't know the answer. Uh, and being a scientist is the privilege to try and answer the question yourself without attending to the adults in the room. Unfortunately, you know, most people become the adults in the room and pretend they know more than they actually know without evidence. And so my advice to young people is never become the adults in the room. It's a very simple message. Yeah, remain childlike, but not childish. So the, the question about evidence in the parapsychological world is, is exactly the, the same way that Avi just described. So I'm working on an experiment involving optical physics. And so this will be the instrument that is used. Now, the, the source of the influence is presumably something to do with consciousness, but nevertheless, we're still using instruments and recording data. So in that sense, it's, it's really the same. Yes. And I can see the childlike curiosity in your faces, actually, every time we talk, let me just mention that. Okay, I have a last question before we open it up for comments from the audience. And it's a, it's a strange one. Perhaps you've never been asked that, and even less in a context where there, there are two of you here. So I wonder if, if well, there was nobody watching, uh, not more than 100 people live right now, and that was kind of, a let's say, a, a lab meeting where you're discussing. I would like, if possible, that each of you asks the other person about some deep problem you're working on where you think advice from another scientist could help. Like, look, I'm working on this and I don't really know how to go forward or, or maybe I do, but this, there's a deeper problem underneath. Hey, what do you think about that? And I think we scientists do this all the time. And here, perhaps we can, we can listen and understand more about your own works by hearing each other ask for help to the other. Sure. I mean, I, I'm happy to ask Dean uh, something. I mean, there are lots of things I don't understand, but perhaps he can uh, educate me on the issue of how language and cognition are related. So in other words, uh, well, it's obvious that if you take a cave dweller and bring it uh, the cave dweller to New York City, the, uh, there will be a, a sense of a religious awe when the cave dweller will see all the technologies, all the gadgets. But I'm more interested in the question of whether the cave dweller would be able to communicate with us today, or if we were to uh, interact with uh, humans, you know, that represent our future a million years from now, is there a way for us to really understand them? And of course, if we ever encounter extraterrestrials, you know, like from a billion years uh, into our future, how do we understand, you know, is there a way to, what is the best uh, way to interpret or infer what, what they want to say? Or do, do you have any insight as to how uh, language connects with uh, level of cognition? Oh, deeply related. Uh, I think here's where AI could, could actually help us uh, with language understanding models. Uh, but the, I actually was involved in a, a similar question some years ago where there was uh, well, questions about where should we bury nuclear waste? And it's going to be uh, radioactive for 50,000 years. And so we have to provide information to people 50,000 years from now. Don't go digging here because it'll kill you. Well, how do we do that? We can't use language you know today because who knows if there'll be anyone in 50,000 years. And the solution ended up being pictures. 
So pictures of people uh, digging and then showing things like X's, and it's still contemporary ideas about what those pictures mean. But nevertheless, we, we thought that any form of written language would not do. We need some form of pictorial language. So maybe something like that. If there'd be the, the movie uh, Arrival was actually a good representation of that, where the, initially there was no way to communicate at all, except eventually, yes, they recognized that the, an image could actually portray an enormous amount of information. So that's what I would say. Go to the science fiction authors who have been dealing with this issue in fiction for a long time. Many of them are actually pretty clever. And of course, well, what I have in mind is the Star Trek universal communicator. I feel good because the producer of a new documentary about my research also made the arrival. So maybe oh, that's, so that's perfect good. then. Yes. Okay. Do you have any question to me? Yeah. So we, we have fairly good evidence that there's some form of uh, retrocausality that, that humans are capable of interacting with. We see this for just as one example in, in an experiment where you uh, measure someone's psychophysiology, either electrocortical activity or autonomic activity, and uh, you expose them in sequence to series of calm or, or uh, emotional pictures that are randomly selected. So you, nobody knows in advance what they're about to see. And there's a gap so that they can recover between that. And the hypothesis is that if, if part of your awareness is extended through time, that maybe your, your body as an unconscious portion of your mind begins to respond before the emotional pictures in a way that's different than before the calm pictures. So this has been done now. There's something like four dozen experiments. Uh, I forget how many, 10 or so different laboratories have done this. And it turns out that there is a, a precursor a t a result that cannot be inferred and is uh, compatible with the idea that somehow we are gearing up for an emotional event, sometimes up to 10 seconds in advance before the event was even selected by a random number generator. So it, that's one of several different classes of evidence suggesting that there's some slipperiness in time that we are capable of responding to. So let, let, take that a, as, a, as an observation and let's assume that it's simply going on all the time and we're not paying attention to it. That's a major challenge to our epistemology, because we we often assume that now is now and the future doesn't affect us. But even as you know from quantum mechanics, that it looks as though the present is influenced by the past and maybe by the future as well. So how can we do an experiment then to uh, where, where we're not assuming that the future is going to influence the present? Because most of our experiments don't assume that. We assume that we're, all we need to worry about is the past and not some future action. And and I and I'm asking because we don't have a good answer to that. Well, um, you know, the question of whether the future can come back uh, is really fundamental, and there are uh, experiments trying to uh, look for violations of the basic assumption that the time is ordered and you can't really go back and. So far, we we are not aware of um, a physical system that shows it, but I, it's definitely worth exploring. I completely agree with you. Now, with respect to the human experience, I would argue that um, you know Darwinian selection uh, favored uh, the human mind as uh, being so sensitive to what is happening, such that it can forecast what is about to happen. And the reason is that those animals uh, or th those people who had that capacity, they could reproduce better because mm -hmm. they had a better sense of their environment and the, the opportunities that they have and so forth. And um, so perhaps there was some uh, selection bias some uh, uh, that, that shaped our mind in a way that uh, responds to the most likely thing about to happen. So we have some kind of a probability estimate in our mind and we respond and it seems to work because we have some experience and we know what to forecast based so you just need to uh, keep in mind that we have the human brain that allows us to um, forecast based on what we already know about the past what might lie in the future so it may look as if we have a prophecy but in fact it was based on some calculation in the human brain and so that's what i would offer as an explanation but of course it's a very interesting question to 
check if uh, systems, physical systems are affected, not just by the, the conditions in their past, but also in their future. And um, I, I would leave it to the experimentalists to uh, test it. And uh, I should say that uh, in the context of quantum mechanics, if you have a system that is made of components and uh, you separate them at a large distance and you measure one component such that its uh, detection affects the other component in a very immediately, you know, without waiting for the signal to cross the gap between them. Uh, that is called the quantum entanglement. And uh, it was verified experimentally that indeed the the other part of the system already knows immediately once you measure the one part of the system. So um, there are ways by which uh, a system, quantum system, is aware of all of its components, but uh, it's not clear how relevant that is to the human experience that you described. And um, once again, there are lots of things we don't fully understand, and it's best to, to do experiments to figure out if we are missing something. I, I completely agree with you. All right. Well, once more, thank you for your honesty, your clarity, your generosity. Um, Avi and Dean, you, you, lead, you lead by example, and this is a rare, a rare treasure today. Thank you very much. And now we can open it up for the audience. Thank you. Thank you both, Avi and Dean. This was a wonderful conversation. And we can now open the call up <clears throat> to the rest of you. If you would like to come in with a question, you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. There are a lot of us here today in this call. So I ask you to please keep your questions focused to the point and short so that we give space to everybody to be able to come in and ask their, their questions. So with that, I invite you, Sperry, to come in. Well, not quite you know what just happened, but uh, oh, there I am. Okay. So we know that Einstein said that all the laws of physics have to appear the same to every observer, but he also said that uh, observation is independent of absolute space and time. And uh, Dr. Beekler and I have come up with uh, a number of papers to address this uh, theoretically. That can actually be found, the evidence could be found to confirm our theories in astrophysical evidence that is being measured. And we'd love to know what avenues there might be to have our work be uh, assessed uh, by people like yourself, Avi Loeb, and, uh, and Dean, because uh, it's very difficult to get anyone to pay attention to anything innovative, as you've all said. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead, Dean. That, you... that is a, it's a, a chronic problem. I, I get asked to review papers and books all the time, and I just don't have enough time to do that and to do the kind of work that I want to do as well. So uh, it, the, the, the game for me, at least oftentimes is to submit to a journal, gets rejected, submit it to another, gets rejected. It can sometimes take three years to find a journal that's willing to, to publish it. But that's, Par for the course as well. Um, yeah, and I should say that in in uh, science um, it should be more straightforward in a way because um, uh, you can demonstrate that there is nothing wrong with the calculation, that there is nothing wrong with data if you have a strong enough um, data set. So eventually. Uh, you get your voice heard. Uh, it may take a while because some people want to suppress it. And, uh, you know, the, I, I witnessed that um, uh, when my statements were unusual, where they were significant. So in a way, it's a, a litmus test. If you are saying something important, then very often you get attacked. You, there is a huge amount of pushback. So I see it actually as... Um, uh, a sign of uh, uh, that I'm doing the right thing if I get pushback. Yeah, it's it's a badge of courage. Take it that way. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Sperry, for coming in. Niels, please come in. Yes. <clears throat> Very interesting. Thank you. It's been a really good uh, conversation. 
And uh, what, what worries me is really only one thing, and that is in terms of reality. What would reality be if we try to, in the, the absolute reality, what would that be if we try to think about that? It's, it's appear, apparently it's not what the, the sphere we operate within because we, we, we fail to see the connection between things in, in a realistic way. We don't ask what is it for or why, why should it be this? We don't ask that, we just blindly take the data and we manipulate the data with some kind of uh, mathematical formula. And uh, I, I'm beginning to believe that the current mathematics is not actually fundamental because it's based on forms. So we have to presume that it has a form before we can test the data. And as an as a engineer, I'm very well aware that all optimizations are sub-optimizations. And I think that if you take the universe and everything in it, it's perfect optimization. Well, um, well I should say that um, part of your um, confusion about <clears throat> what reality is was uh, actually caused by theoretical physicists in, in, in the past half a century because <clears throat> they develop um, very sophisticated math that was intended in part to demonstrate intellectual gymnastics. And you can see it very well in the context of string theory. Uh, now, I have a much more simple-minded approach um, to reality, um, and I can demonstrate it with an example. Suppose I had a problem, uh, you know, that I wanted to fix with the toilets at home. Okay, so I invite a plumber, and I say to the plumber, please fix that problem for me. Now, if the plumber says, sorry, it's too complicated, I say, well, uh, so can you fix... Uh, the pipe that is broken uh, near the faucet and the you know that's something in reality right so because i cannot use that that faucet mm -hmm. and the plumber might say no that's also too complicated but the plumber imagine the plumber before leaving your home telling you oh if you actually put the metaverse goggles on your head which you can buy on amazon from uh, mark zuckerberg then in the metaverse, I'm actually solving all your problems. You just need to put those goggles on your head. What would you say? You would say, thank you very much and close the door. Now, what do string theorists say? They say, I, I ask them, can you please explain to me what happened before the Big Bang? That's like having the toilets not working. So they say, well, it's too complicated. But we are developing a theory that unifies quantum mechanics and gravity and could potentially give the answer, but we can't, this is too complicated. So then I say, okay, well, forget about the Big Bang. Can you actually explain to me what happens inside a black hole, which is another place where quantum mechanics and gravity should, you know, if they are unified, can explain what happens. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, it's too complicated, but... If you imagine that there are extra dimensions, let's say 11 extra dimensions, spatial dimensions, then in the context of the extra dimensions, I can solve some problems that have nothing to do with the Big Bang, nothing to do with your, your you know, with the, um, the black hole problem. Then I say, thank you very much and close the door. But those people are for 50 years representing the frontiers of theoretical physics. And they're causing a confusion to people like you because then you say, okay, well, what does the math actually mean? Okay, you're showing me all these gymnastics and Brian Greene praising string theory as being at the forefront of physics and so forth. Would you buy a used car from Brian Greene? <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with that. The thing is, I have, I work with a, a computer modeling of transportation, and I found a very simple algorithm that will give you what I call complete consciousness. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. For think of that. I mean, you're welcome to come back to me. Okay, thank um, you. I, I have a, an answer for Neil as well. Please, uh, please. And that is that uh, when I uh, when I have a, a complex problem I'm working on with quantum mechanics, I'll ask my dog. And I can tell that my dog is paying very close attention. Uh, he His ears will perk up if I happen to mention a word that he recognizes. Uh, but for, I, if I can put myself in my dog's place, he has no idea what I'm talking about. And so when it comes to the questions about fundamental nature of reality, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't think that an individual is actually capable. Human individuals are not capable of understanding reality directly. And one of the ways we think about that is you talk to a mystic who has a mystical experience and comes back from that and and they say it's it's mind blowing. I, I I saw the face of reality itself. Well, well, can you tell me what that is? And the answer is always no, because there's no language to describe what that experience is. So that's already several steps up from my dog. My dog doesn't even have that. So I I'm not too worried about the the fact that I don't, I don't think we're gonna as humans in their current form will be, ever be able to understand the nature of reality in any completeness. Okay. So what we can do is chop away at things that we can study and perhaps hope that we're going perhaps, in the right direction. Perhaps there are people who can understand that. Yeah. And, and you just you just don't know them. You can't you can't know that I don't understand that. That's that's All my right. proposition. Thank so you're you're welcome to have else. a Thank you for to have a discussion that. about this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I am now going to pass it over to Michael, who has a question. So, uh, who's sitting here beside me? So, let me bring you in, Michael. Okay. Uh, I have a question for Dean. Uh, Dean, uh, some, and this is bouncing off of someone who posted in the chat as well. Uh, they had a question about synchronicity. So now, there's with your research that you do with the psi work, like the, the psychic and the, do you believe, or are there indications that we're kind of digging into things that are inherently co connected in terms of wholeness? And you had mentioned chopping just a minute ago about like, we tend to chop in science and my original background's engineering and then uh, programming systems development and things. So if the nature of measurement is to chop, is it possible that if we chop in a different way, we might see more pat different patterns that would that then something like synchronicity that we're not able to measure with our current tools because they're not set up for those types of patterns might be able to pick up on. If I take a, a the example would be a ruler. If I measure in inches, is the table made up of inches or is it made up of centimeters if I flip it to the other side? So... Yeah. Well, so, so I think actually we can measure synchronicities because no. every every experiment involving a parapsychological phenomenon is an exercise in creating a synchronicity, right? What is a synchronicity? A meaningful coincidence. So if we're studying something like telepathy and we get a meaningful coincidence that this person describes something that somebody else gets, from a different perspective, that would be a synchronicity. Outside of the lab, it is a synchronicity. In the lab, it was a protocol that we set up to see if we can see that thing happen. So there's almost a correlation there with uh, trying to measure entanglement, right? And tele telepathic case, you're looking for stronger than classical correlations between two things that are separated from each other. Well, we, we see that often enough to, to have some confidence that these things are real. That then is a kind of a microscopic created synchronicity, which is, of course, not the same as Jung was talking about, because in his case, it was always spontaneous. Here, we're talking about one that's actually created by virtue of the experimental design. Now, to kind of bounce off that, do you see in the way you model things, any connection possibly between synchronicity and intuition? I had a friend who here, who I had a discussion with the other night, and he was like, he views intuition as an experience, which would kind of throw it in a similar realm as something like synchronicity. So I'm wondering if you're kind of playing with intuition at all, or if you're seeing any interesting cross cuts with, I guess I'm trying to unbox and things. Yeah, you're asking for a two hour lecture. 
So um, I'll, I'll just, well, I'll, just say, <laughs> yeah, no, I'll just say there, there's at least two forms of intuition. One form okay. is forgotten expertise, mm. right? A firefighter mm. will learn through lots of experience. They'll get an intuition about whether they should run into a burning building or not. Sure. So that's yeah. that's, that's something like then that. Then there's a more of, of something like a noetic form of intuition, which is, for want of a better word, some form of psychic knowledge coming from somewhere else. All right. So and the forgotten expertise is interesting, but not something that we're all that interested in because you can think of mundane ways of thinking about it. The noetic experience is more interesting because somehow somebody knows something and they don't even know how they know it. Well, we can study that in the lab too. In many ways, that is very similar to what we would call an experiment in remote viewing or clairvoyance. You're getting information. You don't know how you're getting it. So, I mean, right. showing up somehow, and it turns out to be correct. So in that sense, it is a studyable phenomenon. Mm. Uh, and as I said before, the meta-analyses show that it, it's a real thing, too. Yeah. From both so frequentist or Bayesian statistics, take your pick. They're both quite strong. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, now uh, I invite John to, to join us. Oh, it says John, maybe it's Gina. Oh, yes, yeah. it's Gina pays out. Um, <laughs> John is my John is my late husband, John pays out. He was a scientist. I am not. Um, Alex, you might remember me. I'm the filmmaker um, working on a project called Physics for Poets. And you suggested a change in the title. Um, Poet, poetry for physics, but I'm going with physics for poets right now. What, uh, I don't know if this is so much of a, of a question, but there's some things that just really resonated with me today um, as a writer of science, as a filmmaker who deals with science issues. And the last gentleman spoke of synchronicity. And there's been so many themes coming up today I don't know, gentlemen, have any of you ever heard of Arthur Kessler's books, The Sleepwalker, hmm. about Johann Kepler? Yes. Um, it's a book. Okay. I'd like to know, what are your feelings on that, on that book? Do you think Arthur Kessler, as he moves into some, some science questions, um, I know he addresses uh, the nature of metaphysicism using Kepler as an example, um, Anyhow, that was the book that kind of got me started on this project. And I'm curious to know if you've read it, what, what's your assessment of, of the book, briefly? Yeah, yeah, I know of Kessler's work, but not that specific one. Okay, and then Kessler also wrote a book on synchronicity. Uh, one of his last books, if not the last book. And of course, uh, it's a fairly, um, it's quite a discourse. But the, the gentleman who was an engineer, it was an engineer who put that book in my hands. And if, if he can find it, I think he would really enjoy exploring the content in there. Arthur, Arthur Kessler's um, quite, quite, a, quite a mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up um, is, I'm not sure who it was. I think, Dean, you mentioned that we can take comfort in the history of science. Okay, my personal experience, I grew up in a family of academics and scientists, physicists, and there was lots and lots of children's stories and the, the Marvel comics, heroes of science, a Louis Pasteur was an example, and that kind of got, helped encourage my interest in science. I don't see a lot of that today in science education where we're, we're studying um, the challenges met by scientists of the past, the problem solving that they did. And I'm just wondering, um, do you think we should be offering more history of science in our, at a public school level? Thank you, thank you, Gina. I, would you like to respond, Dean? Well, yeah, in one word, yes. <laughs> okay. Clearly, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gina, for coming in. Oh, thank you. And I just wanted to say that, again, another theme is we may not recognize the signal 
um, who knows what's going on out there and we might not have the language, the vernacular, um, per the, the perceptual ability to recognize messages that, that could easily be out there. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, very thank much. You. Really engaging conversation today. Mark, please come in. Uh, you need to unmute. You're me. muted, Mark. Uh, yes, can you hear me? So I, I was uh, on the subject that uh, arose about forgotten expertise, experience, poetic in, in, intuition. I think that was the crux of the dialogue between uh, Dean and Avi uh, on Avi's on Dean's experiment, or could be framed as precognition, I suppose, where I think Avi was essentially you keep cutting argument. out, so we're not hearing your question. Sorry about that. Oh, gosh. Um, any better? Hmm. At all? Oh, no. I see. Somebody's calling me. Hold. Okay. Oh. Um, you can move I to another to one and he could type yeah, it, maybe. Absolutely. He could type it. Yeah. Jari, would they like to come in? Yari? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm from Finland. It's uh, 20 past 9 p.m. at the moment. So uh, <laughs> it, it has been lovely to follow this conversation. Uh, um, when I was younger, I was working as a physics teacher in university, te teaching MSc engineering students, teaching them quantum mechanics, uh, nuclear physics, electromagnetism, and so on. I'm not PhD physicist, I only have an MSc degree in physics, but I have been working mainly in the field of environmental engineering in the past 25 years in many countries in the world. But I'm still interested in physics and question for Abraham. This is very clear question. Should we abandon a standard model in physics because there has been little progress since establishment of so-called uh, electroweak unification theory that Tomonaga and uh, Richard Feynman developed a unification theory where they managed to combine uh, weak interaction and electromagnetism. That was the, some kind of triumph of physics. It, was, uh, it has been very successful, but uh, when we are carefully looking for the results of the standard model, it can't explain what is the dark energy, what is the dark matter? Uh, what is the origin of the mass? Very basic thing. I have phone here. This is a mass, but the standard model can't explain where the mass is coming from. And there are many things that the standard model can't explain. So my question, should we abandon it totally and go to explore in the unknown fields of physics? That's my question, Abra. Well, this is an excellent question. Um, I would recommend not uh, abandoning the search for knowledge, but uh, using new techniques, because what we have been doing over the past century was smashing particles at increasingly high energies. It started with uh, Rutherford. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we built uh, the Large Hadron Collider. We discovered the Higgs, uh, which was anticipated, nothing really new there. The, it was old news from the 60s. And you are right that the, the standard model of particle physics uh, is pretty much uh, unchanged. Um, uh, and it was like that uh, for decades. Of course, we have some hints that the neutrinos have a mass, but that is not fundamental knowledge of something really new. And so what I would uh, say is that, uh, okay, we have invested huge sums of money at smashing particles at increasingly higher energies, and we can continue to do the same. But uh, as Albert Einstein said, if you keep doing the same and uh, get uh, anticipating new results, uh, it's, not a sign, you know, it's not a sign of you being smart. You want to try some other ways. And um, so... At the same time that we have been smashing particles, we found that most of the universe is made of material that we don't know uh, its nature. And uh, we haven't seen it in the solar system. And 
so the question is, can we detect the, the nature of dark matter in different ways other than smashing particles? Of course, with the Large Hadron Collider, there was a hope that we'll find the lightest supersymmetric particle. It wasn't there. So um, we should try other ways of detecting the dark matter. That should be a high priority. Uh, also, understanding the dark energy. There, we don't have even a clue as to how to figure out why the vacuum has an energy density that is 120 orders of magnitude below what the modern theoretical physics would have expected. Okay, so in the old days, people said, well, if it's so small, it cannot be more than 120 orders of magnitude below what we expect. Therefore, it must be zero. When I came into physics, that was the notion. But then astronomers discovered it. And by the way, the string theorists at the time said, well, check your data, look again through your telescopes. It must be zero because we can't understand why it would be non-zero. But it ended up being non-zero, 120 orders of magnitude below what string theorists expected. So then they came up with the excuse that maybe it's because we, it allows us to exist, that if it were much larger, galaxies like the Milky Way wouldn't be, uh, exist and so forth. That's called the anthropic uh, principle. It's not satisfactory to me. There must be some more fundamental reason for the value of the cosmological constant of the dark energy. So I completely agree with you that the, the current record of uh, experimental physics is disappointing in the sense that we haven't discovered anything fundamentally new. I mean, we discovered gravitational waves that were predicted a hundred years ago. We discovered black holes that uh, were predicted also around the same time, a, sh a few months after Einstein wrote his equations. But nothing really that fundamentally changed the way we see the universe in a, a, a completely new knowledge a, a, did not come forward over the past few decades. And I would ascribe that to the method that we are using, which is continuing to do the same thing that we did in the past instead of trying new things. And part of it is be, is because of uh, uh, the community being risk averse. You know, when you write proposals uh, to, uh, to get grant money, often you're asked to forecast what you will discover in year one, year two, and year three. And that's completely contradictory to the way that discovery uh, happened, uh, you know, is, is taking place. It, it should be unexpected. And people should be funded to explore the unknown in ways that are different than the traditional ways. So I would argue that we should try uh, to look at anomalies. We should use methods that are different. Than, so more money should be allocated to innovation. And frankly, you know, the private sector, the commercial sector is already recognizing that you have, uh, you know, um, communities of people within Apple, within Google, within uh, Facebook that, you know, that are thinking about blue sky research, um, much more open minded than you find in academia. So I think something is wrong in academia. If you ask me fundamentally, I think uh, academia needs to be corrected on that. And one way to correct it is not to allow those that are conservative uh, that uh, experts, those that uh, want to build those echo chambers that repeat their mantras, uh, instead of them being on the selection committee of grants, uh, you know, you should put uh, 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 even a random method of assigning grants to individuals without even looking at what they are proposing would do better than uh, those experts giving the money to their friends that keep doing the same thing and not finding anything. Okay, thank you, Abraham. So, Thank the second you. question Thank is, well, I have we're one the, more. We're getting short of time. So I wanted to ask, Dean, did you want to say anything? No, but it, it's music to my ears. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, at this point, I'm going to hand it back to all three of you. And um, if there are any closing remarks, anything that you would like to, to say at this point. Um, yeah, I would uh, hope that the, uh, we will get a, uh, a, a wake up call because, you know, when I look at the news every day, it doesn't look like humans are getting better. They are not learning from experience. We keep having wars. Uh, we keep having uh, uh, communities that are not attending to facts, but to their narrative. And that is amplified by social media now. It used to be less uh, prevalent, but social media basically allows you to get the news that you want to hear. And uh, 
Um, so I'm really worried. And the only solution I can see is if we will get a letter from a neighbor that will say, the reason that we survived much longer than you did is because th we did this and that. That will be our salvation. And I very much hope to open that letter. And that's what I, I will dedicate the remaining years of my scientific career to. Yeah, well, well said. And so the uh, the people giving us those uh, messages uh, might be from uh, some extraterrestrial source and maybe from some other sources as well. So I, I agree, keeping our eyes and ears open to uh, wiser people who can tell us how they've survived a million years as opposed to us, which are on the edge of extinction. Yeah, we're, we're infants in, uh, in, in the, from the point of view of how long a species has existed in our current form, we're babies. Thank you very much. And what a lovely way to celebrate Galileo at 400 with the conjunction of the two of you. I believe you first met in this book, writing the forward and afterward of the journey of the founder of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And I'm so happy you, you had a chance to meet again here today. And just to say that, that you're two superb embodiments of the scientific art of pursuing anomalies wherever they take us. And, and thank you for that. And I hope your minority reports become majority reports. Or maybe no, maybe they don't need to. Maybe it's good like that. Anyways, I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. We look forward to seeing you next week when we'll have the final part in this series, Expanding the so Scope of Science with the Galileo Commission. Um, and so that will be on Tuesday, October 31st. So you will all receive um, the link to that, to that um, session, and we look forward to seeing you then. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Bye-bye. Bye. See you soon. Thank you.